John and I have one thing in common. I'm not James either, right? <laughs> <laughs> so good morning, church. Good morning. As we kind of talked about, our pastor, if you're new, and I think we do have some new people here, right? Our pastor, James Mendoza, is on sabbatical. And we're really glad that we're able to do that for him. So as we kind of take the next couple of months to recharge, revitalize, and they'll come back towards us uh, towards the end of the summer. Until then, I'm filling in today and then next week, and then I think uh, David is also preaching, and Alex, and then Ken Black, and I'll be rounding out the summer. So, uh, One more thing I want to hit on uh, what Tyler was talking about. In the back is the sign-up sheet for the 25th. And this is an opportunity for us to actually be the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. So this isn't a week to take off a church. Um, they are our neighbors. We rent the hall from them. And now is our opportunity to give back and actually serve and actually be Jesus Christ to other people. So the expectation is that all of us will be here on the 25th, right? So the sign-up sheet's back there. Go ahead and sign up. Read what's on there. If you have information or you need more information, talk to Ken Black, and he'll get that to you. One more thing. Are the clerks here? I've got a hair on my nose. Could you guys stand up real quick? Everybody know? I think everybody knows the clerks, right? Does everybody know that the clerks are full-time missionaries here in San Antonio? Does anybody that didn't know that? Thanks. You guys, you guys can sit down. Well, now you guys have seen Jason and Sarah, if you hadn't done so already. But uh, I called him up here the last couple of days, and I wanted to know how well we as the church have been doing because – Vista has partnered with the Clarks in the work that the Lord has put on their heart to evangelize college students here in San Antonio. And when I say Vista has partnered with the Clarks, I don't mean the leadership of Vista. I mean Vista Community Church has partnered with the Clarks. And I was actually really encouraged talking to Jason. I didn't know this, but evidently a lot of people, a lot of people have actually contacted him and gone out to serve with him. I know John Wade has and and I know the women of Vista have done a lot of stuff, so they, they need support. So you've seen him. Contact him. We're going to soon get your information up on the website and everything. And the expectation is that all of us will join with them in the work that the Lord's put on their hearts, right? Not all of us can be missionaries. Not all of us have the gift of gab like he does, but we can do something there, right? So I'll let you talk to Jason and uh, figure out how best you can uh, work with them. So what are we talking about today? So we're talking about the always popular, always entertaining subject of doctrine. Well, I, I'm not talking about doctrine per se. I told this to Angelo, and he's like, he kind of looked at me. He's like, well, there's a lot of doctrine out there, right? Yes, yes, that's a, it's a big concept. We're not talking specifically about doctrine. We're trying to answer this question, why doctrine? And expanding that, why is doctrine important and relevant to us today in the church? So I got two goals for us here that I hope to uh, show to you guys. I want to show you why it's relevant to you, the layperson, and me. It's not just for the pointy nose, glass, eyeglass pushing guys in the ivory towers at seminaries to sit there and debate and go back and forth. This is relevant stuff to all of us. And then I want you to understand why it's important that you need to know your doctrinal positions on these biblical truths. And I, I say that very specifically. I say your doctrinal positions because the church has doctrinal positions on everything in this book. But unless you've internalized that, unless you know what you're studying and what you're reading, then it doesn't do the body any good. And it doesn't do the world any good. It's just something we put up on the shelf and we go about our business. So why this response? And maybe I'm being overly cynical. You know, Maybe you guys were like, yes, doctrine. Today, let's talk about it. But I don't think so. I think this is the response most people get in the church today when we bring up that word, doctrine. So why is that? And I, you know, I think there's a lot of reasons that we respond that way. I think, one, we think it's overly intellectual. Like I said, it's for those guys in the seminaries. It's too complicated. You know, I think some people think it's divisive. You know, the church, this is something the church argues over and it splits us up so we don't need to talk about it. Well, I don't really buy that argument because really all we're doing is getting to the truth of what God has revealed to us in his word. And if we're going to say, oh, I don't want to get to the truth of what God's revealed to us because I might disagree with my brother or sister, 
Yeah, bless you. That doesn't really fly, does it? No, we're commanded to look into the scriptures. We're commanded to look into the truths that God revealed, has revealed to us. But it's this kind of thing that made it really hesitant for me to actually preach on this today. Because I don't get up here too often, right? You guys see me two, three times a year. And that makes it easy and hard for me to do this. You know, it's, uh, it's kind of hard because I'm just not a natural preacher. That's not my gifting. I think my gifting is teaching, but not necessarily standing up here speaking to you guys. But it's easy because I just preach what the Lord's been putting on my heart in the preceding months or whatever. And this is in different ways and, and, and different times this has come up, and I've just really been meditating on this, this whole issue of why we're getting away from this. And so it was easy for me to come up here and do this. But I still, I was wrestling with it. And so earlier this week, I actually, I was at uh, work, and I took some time out of, I keep looking down because I, I know I'm going to step off of this thing. So I'm just, I'm just waiting for that. But I took some time out of work to actually sit and pray. And I was like, oh, I don't, I don't want to preach to a sleeping church, Lord. I, I know you've been putting this on my heart, but please just make it clear what you want me to say to them. And then shortly after that, a buddy of mine comes in from work. He's a Christian friend of mine. We always discuss Christian things and, or things of the faith. And he's telling me the story, right? And he's telling me the story. He goes to a Baptist church, solid doctrine Baptist church. And he's telling me the story of this lady that goes to his church. And she said, yeah, she's kind of pulled away, and I went to talk to her this week, yada, yada, yada. And he says she's pulled away because she's gotten involved in the Hebrew roots movement. Has anybody heard of that? Just curious. Hebrew roots. You've heard of that? I'd never heard of it. You know, so he's telling me, you know, hey, she's in church. She's pulled away. She no longer comes to church. She watches sermons online by their guru, master, whoever this guy is. And he's trying to convince them to get back to their Hebrew roots. He says, you know, Jesus kept the feast and Jesus kept the law and yada, yada, yada. So we need to keep the feast. We need to keep the law. And she bought into this hook, line, and sinker. So she supposedly she goes and she washes her vegetables a certain way. I don't know. I don't know anything about that. But I, 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 it was confirmation to me that this is relevant. She didn't understand the doctrinal positions of the church, and she was going to a good Bible-based church, and she got pulled away, and she got hooked away. So what is doctrine? I mean, it's pretty simple. I mean, you can go and you can find some more difficult definitions, but it's just correct and sound teaching. That's what doctrine is, correct and sound teaching. But it's important to remember that it's a, we arrive at that correct and sound teaching through a systematic way, through a methodology. And the problem comes when people start picking and choosing certain things, and they don't look at the whole countenance of God, the whole Bible. And when they do that, you come up with these crazy doctrines and these crazy teachings, and people buy into it. But we don't add to Scripture. Doctrine doesn't add to Scripture. Doctrine takes what God has revealed to us in the Scriptures and makes sense of it. My Bible, I just looked this morning, Revelations 22, is 2,000 pages long. I mean, that's a lot, right? But like I said, the Holy Spirit through the church has, has done this work. And there's doctrinal positions on all of this stuff. But we don't get there by adding our viewpoints in there. And I, I could give you a million examples of how different groups and organizations have done that um, to the detriment of the word of God. But there's authority and there's responsibilities that the Bible lays out for dealing with the scriptural truths that are inherent in the Bible. But it all starts with that sentence down there. It's all understood through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's where it starts. 1 Corinthians 2.10 through 13, hopefully you guys can read this, says the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. So when we start getting into the Bible and, and digging deep to get those truths out, we can only do that through spiritual discernment. We can't do that on our own power. And when we do, we end up with these Hebrew root movements, right? So it's understood by the power of, of the Holy Spirit, but the authority is in Scripture. 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness, that the man, and I added this, or woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. 
And some of your Bibles, this is out of the New King James ver Version, some of your Bibles actually say instruction as opposed to doctrine. The word can be used either way. But the Bible is our authority for getting Scripture that we discern through the Holy Spirit. And then the next level is the responsibility that's out there. I'll get to you guys in a second. But there's responsibility for the pastors and the elders of the church to guard the sheep gates, so to speak, right? James is awesome. James comes up here, and every week he gives you guys good, solid teaching, good, solid, sound doctrinal teaching. But that, responsi that responsibility is levied on him and whoever sits here and, and, and preaches out of here. And if you guys want to be small group leaders, don't get offended if we start asking you questions about where you stand on things because you have a responsibility also. First Timothy, and most of you guys maybe know this, but first, second Timothy, Titus, those are called the pastoral letters, right? They're profitable for all of us to read and get something out, but they had a very specific purpose. When Paul was writing to Timothy, when Paul was writing to Titus, the purpose was for this, for, for, for gar guarding and, uh, and shepherding the flock in these kind of matters. So 1 Timothy says this, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received through thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Take heed to yourselves and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourselves and those who hear you. I mean, this is a strong exhortation to Timothy, right? First thing I'll point out is that doctrine doesn't save you, right? We know it saves you. When you put your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, right? That's what saves you. But he's saying that if you don't guard your doctrine... If you don't guard your doctrine, then that kind of stuff starts to get skewed. Those, those, those waters start to get muddied. And the other thing that he points out here is that there is a doctrine taught by demons. And Jennifer brought it up here, and Mindy brought it up last week. But there is an enemy of your soul and my soul that wants to take us off course. We shouldn't be surprised at all that there's a multitude of different religions out there that there's different sects of Christianity and heretical sects of Christianity, we shouldn't be surprised at all. I mean, that's his job, to steal, kill, and destroy, right? And Satan is singular. He's one being. But he has a hierarchy of demonic forces who have been trying since the very get-go to destroy the church. So that shouldn't shock you. And not just the church, he's trying to destroy you guys. And if you're a believer, he can't take that away, but he can destroy your testimony. So thank you, Jennifer, for reminding us about that. And in Titus, it says this, for a bishop, I put that in there, elder, that's what Vista community, uh, that's the way we conduct our church, must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what's good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Like I said, if you're a teacher at Vista, you're guarding the gate. And we need to be able to exhort, and we need to be able to contradict when false doctrine comes in. That's the responsibility of Pastor James as the shepherd of this flock. That's the responsibility of the elder board. Like I said, you have a responsibility. This isn't something where you can just say, oh, just, you know, all I need is Jesus and I go about my business. All you need is Jesus for salvation. That is very true. But we're commanded to know our doctrine. Hebrews 13, 7, 9. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. And Ephesians 4, 11 says, He himself gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and their cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking truth and love may grow up in all things, in him who is the head, Christ. So you have responsibility here. How are you going to not get blown around and tossed around by every wind of doctrine if you don't know what it is? If you haven't time to get into God's word and study it. 
You know, it's an interesting word picture here. When he talks about being tossed to and fro, carried out by every wind of doctrine, the, the word picture here is being on a boat at sea. And if you're not anchored by something at sea, you're liable to get blown in whatever direction comes away, comes around. And that poor individual, the, the Hebrew Roots Movement lady, obviously wasn't anchored in sound teaching and doctrines that come from Scripture through her church. She didn't take that responsibility seriously. And sure enough, she put the shackles back on of the law, which so obviously, it's funny, like when he was telling me that, I mean, James just got finished talking about Galatians. And, and that's what I was thinking. I was like, man, you, you foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? Why are you putting these shackles of the law back on you? That's just basic, that's just basic doctrine. But she didn't care. I don't know, maybe she didn't, but I mean, I'm just saying evident by the fruit of the direction she's gone to understand her biblical doctrine. My buddy's still asleep over there. I'm trying to see who else is following him. Okay, I don't see any too many heads nodding yet. All right, so I'll keep pressing on. So I said it's relevant. It's relevant to all of us today, right? And hitting on what uh, Jennifer said and what Mindy talked about last week is this passage right here, Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. And you can go back and read the full passage, but I'll, I'll cut to this. It says, and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. So I got props. Some of you guys like props. Is Teresa here and Paul? I knew they'd know what this is. It's a Wonder Woman sword. I haven't seen the movie yet. but So this is, this is an awesome word picture here, too. I mean, almost everybody knows this, right, has heard this. And what Paul's doing here is he, he's using a metaphor of spiritual warfare and equating it to battle and going into battle. Really powerful word picture. And he says that we need to put on the armor of God when we engage in that battle, which we're all doing every single day, like Jennifer said. And this is my, not Wonder Woman sword, this is my sword of the Spirit. So, this is our only offensive weapon, right? And what this represents, the sword of the Spirit, it represents what? It represents the Word of God, the divine revelation of God towards us, right? So my question to you is what good is a weapon that you don't know how to use, right? Because if you're not a believer here today, God bless you, God help you, you don't even have this weapon. You don't have the Word of God. Matter of fact, you probably deny it if you're not a believer. So you're going into this battle defenseless, and you're going to get hacked to pieces spiritually. I'll stand on that. You're going to get hacked to pieces. But if you're a believer here today, you have this weapon. You have the Word of God to some extent, right? You guys know something about the Bible. A lot of you know a lot more than I do. That's for sure. But if you don't know how to use it, what good is it for you? And some of you, as you go through these spiritual battles daily, you fight foes of different strength, right? So some of you, even though you have the Word of God, maybe this is how you fight with it. And when you come up against a, a, a spiritual attack, maybe you, you slap it down a little bit. And maybe you win some of those battles. But there's going to be a time when you come against a foe who's going to pull out their sword, and they're going to hack you to pieces too. And, and, and let, let me be really clear. I'm not talking about salvation and losing your salvation. We do not believe in that. I'm just talking about the daily struggles of life that you get into, right? Some of you guys are a little more proficient. You know, maybe you hold it like this, and maybe you can pound and you can win some, you know, win some more battles because you just pound people to death with it. But we're told to take our sword and use it properly. That's what we're told to do. And, and if you want to be effective in the spiritual warfare, you need to pick up your sword and use it. And I know, James, we've been this big push on discipleship. We've been talking about this a lot. And we've been saying, and we have these summer seminars coming up. And we're saying, hey, let's get into the Word. Let's dive into the Word. Let's study it. It takes effort, though, doesn't it, guys? You know, I was talking about uh, earlier about why people respond the way that, that that guy does to this. And I, and I, th I think it's interesting that 
we are just a product of our culture. You know, we, we live in the give it to me now culture, the instant culture. We, we want everything super quick, super fast, super easy. And I'll throw the, the last year's political debates out there. They take these subjects that are incredibly complex, if you really think about it. Let's take health care, for example. What do they say when that first law came out? It's like 14,000 pages. I mean, how many different inputs into that system are there? Hundreds of thousands, millions? I don't know. So these are incredibly complex issues. But when they debate it, they boil it down to one and two bullet points. They have to keep within two minutes, right? But we like that because we don't want to take the time to read 14,000 pages. We don't really want to take the time to really understand the healthcare issue. So yes, reduce it, boil it down for me so that I can understand it, right? That's our society. I mean, if you can't tell me in a four minute, 20 second YouTube video, I don't want to hear it. I'm already tuning out. But the problem is that is when we start taking those ideas into things that have eternal consequences, right? In our faith, in our study of the word, when we would just want 10, 20 second little quips, give me a verse, I'll throw a verse at it. That's wrong, and that's, that, that's become pervasive in our church. People throw one verse at something, wash your hands, go about their business. No, this stuff takes effort. It does. And, and to be sure, there are very complex issues. Nobody's asking you here to be a th theologian, right? You don't need to be a professional apologist to, s to swing this sword. But you need to know how to use your Bible. You need to know what resources to go when you don't. So, got to find my clicker again. Sound doctrine also protects us against heresy. When we swing this sword properly as individuals and as a collective body of believers, we protect the church against heresy. And I think uh, heresy is one of those words, just like doctrine, that we kind of just pushed into the closet. You know, that's for yesteryear, right? It's archaic, heresy. Who talks about heresy? It talks about doctrine, right? But heresy in its really simplest form, and you can find more complicated definitions out there, it's just false teaching. And even though we don't like to talk about heresy, or we, I don't know how many of us actually use the word heresy in our daily lives, I did just a really simple word, sh word search, BibleGateway.com, boom, heresy. And all of these books of the Bible popped up. And I went and I looked at the various scripture that, that's talking about it. So even though we think it's antiquated, talking about heresy, maybe we think that we shouldn't, but I think a lot of us do, these authors governed by the Holy Spirit, they didn't think it was an antiquated idea. They thought it was a dead serious idea. The church has been fighting off heretical positions since its inception. And we talked about the spiritual warfare. Satan is trying to tear down the church, has been, will be. So this is an important concept. And today, unless you and I are serious about how we study the Bible and what we know to be true versus what we know to be false, then heresy can creep in. So that kind of leads to a, uh, a logical question, which I think is a valid question. How do we know that we have the right doctrine, right? How do we know that? I mean, obviously, we have Scripture. We have the authority of Scripture. And we can study it, and we have the Holy Spirit. But there have been groups that have taken this same Bible and have skewed it way off course. There's groups like the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses that have taken some truly heretical positions offer the same Bible. And then, yeah, mostly uh, they s change the words in the Bible afterwards when they realize that they're, they do a systematic look into it and it doesn't fit, right? But it happens. So how do we know that, that we have the right doctrine? So I want to start first with this, right? Um, Paul said there is no foundation other than Christ Jesus, right? That's where it starts. We have Jesus Christ. And we know that in John it says the word became flesh and the flesh dwelt among us full of grace and truth. So that's the truth there. That's where it starts. And in the end, who's going to be in heaven? Believers, right? And so some of you might disagree with me on this, and this is totally fine. But in the end, out of every orthodox, when we say orthodox, main and plain church, not just Vista or the EFCA, but Baptist, whoever, the, you know, it's, it's at the very end, who's going to be in heaven are the people that believe in Jesus Christ. It's all, so it's all about what you do with Jesus, right? And there's other secondary doctrinal positions underneath that that are very important, but that position, what you do with Jesus Christ, is what dictates where you're going to spend eternity. And like I said, some people have argued this, but I think the Bible very clearly teaches this. And I could probably get a thousand different uh, 
verses to prove this, but I'm just going to read a couple. And, and if you want to go and check me, here they are. It's 1 John 4, starting verse 1. It says, Beloved, do not, be, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. Skipping to 14. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as a Savior for the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And then in chapter 5, he continues. And this is the testimony, that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. And like I said, you might disagree with me, but this is the eternal question that's going to hang on your salvation or your salvation is going to hang on is what are you doing with Jesus Christ? So with that, we start with Jesus. And then it goes to the apostles. So, so, so they walked among him and, and, and he poured into them and then Jesus left and the apostles went out and they did miracles as signs proving that the message they had was authentic. And then the, the apostles left. And this is church history, five-second version, right? And the apostles left, but they pressed that on to the early church founders, early church leaders. And this idea is called apostolic succession. And these church leaders had councils because this time I said that the church is under attack. It's under attack from heretical positions. So they come together and say, hey, this doesn't quite agree with what Paul says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And hey, this guy over here, this doesn't quite agree with what Peter says either. And some people attacked who Jesus was. And they said that Jesus, he, he wasn't fully God. He was just a man that came. And then other people said, no, he wasn't a man. He was just a spirit. And all these heretical things. And, so, and, the, and the church, through the guiding of the Holy Spirit, said no in these councils. And then they came up with these creeds. And I, I grew up in the Presbyterian church and in the early 80s. And we used to, every, every day every, that we go to church, every Sunday, we would say these creeds, the Apostle Creed. I believe in Jesus Christ, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Do some of you guys do that? I don't know if they do it in other churches, right? But these creeds were a good thing because of all these attacks on the church so that they would know every day and they would repeat their doctrinal, doctrinal positions to know what was authentic and what was right. And so when someone came in saying something wacky, like Hebrew roots, they'd be like, eh, nah, that doesn't fit with our creeds. So there's some value in that. And that's not part of our church makeup, but I encourage you to go look into that. There's some value into these creeds. And then the church started to do something here. The church started to elevate tradition and put it at the same level as Scripture. And I said that good doctrine, you don't add anything to Scripture, but the church elevated tradition. But there was a correction, like, hey, wait a second, no, 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 sola scriptura, scripture only. The Reformation, Martin Luther, they said, no, correction, back to course. Do, uh, tradition is not at the same level as scripture. And then from there came the EFCA and other denominations and what we call of orthodox Christianity. Again, orthodox means main and plain, right? The main and plain things that we all agree on. And then Vista Community Church, and that doctrine is guarded by Pastor James, the elder board, and then you guys, right? And along with all other churches, that's the orthodox position of the church. So getting back to the question, how do we know that we have the correct doctrine? Well, we have the scriptures. We have the word of God. We have very well and richly documented church history. I can't believe I hear some of these skeptics out there talking about how Constantine put the, the Bible together. and all. You go out there and read. You can read all sorts of crazy stuff. But the 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 historicity of the early church is amazing. I have a book here that I read, and, and it's not canonical, you know, it's not close to scripture, but it's called The History of the Church. It's by a dude named Eusebius. And this guy lived 300 AD, so he's 200 years removed from Paul, and he was a historian. And he documents, to a, to a great deal, he documents of the life of the early church and the heresies that came, um, came against it. So, I mean, we have internal evidence here in the Bible. I mean, it's not just one book, right? People always say that, you know, the Bible is circular reasoning. The Bible, you know, using the Bible to prove the Bible. No, we don't have just one book here. We have a collection of 66 books by multiple authors over 1,500 years 
with one concise theme and message, and that is Jesus Christ and the redemptive plan for mankind. So we have the internal evidence of the Bible. We have external evidence. I mean, this is just one book. It talks about the people in the letters. Paul in his letters would say certain people, Clement, all these other people, right? Those people really lived. That's not just some old stodgy scripture. Those people lived, and they wrote letters, and we have some of those letters. So like Peter said, you know, we don't follow cleverly devised myths and tales. There's more proof to what happened in the Bible than there is of anything in ancient antiquity. Nobody doubts Socrates. You say, hey, Socrates, I, I took a philosophy class in college, and we talked about what Socrates, Socrates said this. And they just believe it. Aristotle said this. They believe it. There is so much more evidence for what we stand on in our faith and any of that stuff. So don't buy it. You guys have correct doctrine. James preaches correct doctrine. So stand fast in that and don't worry about that. And use it. Learn it. The position, doctrinal positions are out there. Learn about your Bible. And I, I don't mean just pie in the sky stuff. Study your Bible. And when you come across something that doesn't seem like it makes sense or you don't get or it seems like it might be a contradiction, do some research. I mean, we live in the day of the Internet. Could you imagine having to go and read stuff in Latin way back when? You guys have the Internet. But be careful. And that's why I said, Vista, the elders, you, be careful. There's a lot of false teachers, and they have a lot of false doctrine out there. Be careful who you're listening to. 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 15 says this, But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. That pretty much encapsulates exactly what I'm saying. Continue in what you've learned and been assured of. You know who you have learned it from. All right, my buddy's still sleeping, but I'm going to leave you guys with this. First and foremost, Christ saves. And like I talked about, if you're running around without your sword, you are going to get hacked to pieces, guaranteed. So if you're sitting here today and you have not placed your faith in Jesus Christ, there's no time like right now. The gospel message, the doctrine of salvation is super easy. You don't have to be a seminary student to know it. God's holy. His holiness does not allow him to abide sin whatsoever. Maybe you're the perfect person that all you've done in your life is stolen a pencil when you were in grade school. Well, that sin is enough to separate you from a holy God who's perfectly holy. And I know we don't grasp perfect holiness, but he's perfectly holy. So, and that little bit of sin is enough to separate you from God for eternity. And we are all sinners. But the Bible said when there was no way, he made a way. And he sent his son who lived a perfect life fully God, fully man, was crucified, dead, buried, resurrected. And when we put our faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, his blood covers our sins. And so a perfect God doesn't look at us as sinners anymore. He sees the righteousness of Christ. That's all you need for salvation. But remember, there's other issues out there. And once you start going down rabbit trails, you can get picked off. Jehovah's Witnesses, right? And once they start going down those trails, I'll, I'll pick on the Mormons a little bit more. They actually took Jesus Christ, and their Jesus is no longer the Jesus of the Bible. So, yes, all you need is Jesus for salvation, but guard your doctrine, church. Study your scriptures. Because it's easy to get picked off, and that's what Satan's wanting. And it's subtle, and it's nuanced, and he gets you off that trail, and then he'll just keep spinning you. So be careful. So it is relevant. It's relevant for all of us. It's relevant for me. It's relevant for you. And you need to know the positions that the church stands on. And you need to guard your doctrine. So I'd encourage you guys, vistacommunity.org. That's the church's website. When you don't know what the church stands on on certain things, on certain positions, go there. We have a section there. It's called beliefs, our beliefs. It has our basic doctrinal positions on the things that we think are the main and plain. And I guarantee you every other Orthodox church in America agrees on these same things. Yeah, there's, we have minor differences. Sure, we do. 
But go and figure it out. And there's links on there to go to the EFCA website if you want to look there too. So when you're studying and you're wondering what is correct doctrine, you can go to the internet also, right? But be careful. Be careful when you do that. And then the last thing I'll say is this. We're talking a lot about studying the scripture. But the mistake you can make is making it head knowledge, right? At some point, it's got to be transformational. It's got to go from the head to the hands to the feet. It's got to be heart knowledge. We're not learning stuff. We're not studying scripture just to get a big head, right? And again, next week, two weeks from now, we've got to live that out. So the sign-up sheet's in the back. I'd encourage you guys, again, to get into your Bibles this summer, these summer seminars. Get in them. Study your Bible. Know the doctrinal positions of the church as protection. 